Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing what it takes to make the connected world that we live in a safer place for people, business, and governments with our special guest, John Gilligan, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Center for Internet Security, CIS. John, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited about this uh, this topic. Well, Mark, I'm, I'm happy to be able to join you. Thanks for the invitation. So let me set you up here uh, because we've all experienced it, right? There's been an incredible number and diversity of attacks. We've all felt it. Um, to our essential cyber infrastructure. It's just staggering. So according to the cybersecurity hub, there were 2.8 billion, billion with a B, malware attacks worldwide reported in only the first six months of 2022. And ransomware attacks cost roughly $20 billion in 2021, which is forecasted to be an over tenfold increase, right? 250 billion annually by 2031. And add to these attacks, the cyber threats posed by disinformation, fake videos, cyber theft, sale of confidential information, use of social media for nefarious uh, purposes. It's just staggering, isn't it, John? It, it certainly is, Mark. And, uh, and as you described, um, it's getting worse. Um, so you described both the cyber dimension, cyber attack dimension, but you also mentioned in the tail end of your introductory comments, the uh, use of social media and uh, the myths and disinformation um, issue, which uh, we've begun to see. Uh, and in fact, in some um, areas, uh, I'll, I'll, maybe we'll touch on later, elections is a good example. Actually, the myths and disinformation threat is actually a more severe threat, I believe, than the cyber threat um, because of the potential damage. But you're right; it, this is a this is a problem that is growing. The complexity is uh, is growing, and the impact, um, as you point out in your statistics, is also growing. So, and, and there's a convergence of technique, and this is something that I think is really interesting, and it's quite different than what happened before. I would liken it to a con game, which uses uh, pieces of truth, pieces of performance, and then certain techniques that might also include breaking and entering in criminal aspects. And they basically, it becomes all part of a tool set. Some of it is just uh, uh, skewing the truth, skewing perception a little bit. And then you might also include the fact that you have personally identifiable information that could be you that is acquired criminally and then could be used in nefarious purposes to create perceptions and responses in people that they would not actually um support had they known the full story but that but that full story isn't necessarily shared so you've got the criminal side where people are trying to hack my bank account but then you're also you also have this other side which is trying to hack my mind and my response in a way where I might vote in a way that that if I had full information, I wouldn't vote anymore, uh, vote in that way, or it might actually take my information and apply it in ways that I never intended. How do we deal with this? Uh, because it seems to me that we have this shield and and um, and weapon kind of thing where to create a shield that protects us. Um, it's so incredibly complicated. How do we actually deal with this? Yeah, well, Mark, I think I think there are really um, <clears throat> different solutions to uh, the different parts of the problem. So let's focus initially, perhaps, just on the cyber piece. Okay. The cyber piece is, is a is a technical activity. I mean, it's it's uh, it, it may have some human components of uh, phishing, trying to get a uh, a user to uh, to compromise. Uh, the system, but their their underpinnings are technical, and most of the preventions are putting in uh, safeguards. And many of the safeguards are really quite straightforward. The, you know, you've probably heard the team uh, term, you know, basic hygiene. You know, we call it cyber hygiene, <laughs> and uh, that's effective against an awful lot of the uh, cyber attacks. So that's that's that dimension. But when you get into um, what I'll call information operations, which is a lot of the social media activity, um, as you point out, rightfully so, it's really um, 
uh, taking advantage of people who have grown accustomed to um, not uh, carefully reviewing what they're seeing. And so they take, you know, they, they, uh, they subscribe to um, <clears throat> uh, news media, social media that is sympathetic to their point of view. And so it just reinforces their point of view. And even the media is and reporters, you're you're, you're seeing this where you see right. uh, talking points that are parroted, and they go through almost like it, it's almost like a um, you know money laundering, but it's an information laundering process in which um, information starts on the edges, and then and then it's picked up. There are techniques to get it picked up by more and more mainstream uh, organizations until you see unverified claims. Um, being highlighted and repeated and echoed. Um, there, there's a whole process. And the other thing that is interesting, John, I'd love, I'd love for you to talk about this. These are organizations, right? The, the, the people who are criminally involved, who are using the technology that you, uh, you pointed to in the cyber area, these are like companies where they're hiring engineers and they are specifically targeting through groups of people, um, us, right? They're developing tools in order to attack us. And they're in the same thing on the social media side. There are not, not only individual actors, they're organized entities, aren't there? Right. And let me start with the last part. In the social media area, um, we have clear evidence that this has become state sponsored in many cases. And not, not all social media. Uh, mis and disinformation is state sponsored, but they are carefully amplifying and planting seeds um, to uh, sort of build on this lack of trust or concern about certain issues. So as you as you point out, there's sort of different groups. So we have the criminal group, and their motivation is primarily getting money, and so they're primarily focused on cyber. But there is an awful lot of what you might call influence operations. And of course, we have people uh, on the left and the right who want to influence um, to their particular objectives. And, and that it gets particularly dangerous because there's been a polarization of our political environment as well as the media. And so they're amplifying. And so we find we are being driven with regard to information by the fringe. And uh, and as I said, you know, that there's increasing evidence that, in fact, now our foreign adversaries are taking advantage of that and amplifying that. So so a good example is in 2022, there was the expectation that a foreign adversary would attempt a cyber attack, would expect that it would be detected. Once it was detected, then they would start an information operations campaign on social media to uh, raise concern among the public of, see, the election systems are not secure. You can't trust them. And so in this case, you have a cyber activity, but it's really a launching pad for something that is intended to undermine confidence in our elections infrastructure. Let me let me just go through this, because I'm not sure that I that I quite grasp what you said, but, it, but it's incredibly interesting. So you're saying that government actors are basically hiring uh, technologists, so engineers, to create um, programs that attack our election systems. They expect those programs to not be successful, right? Correct. Right. But regardless as to whether they're successful or not, let's say all those attacks fail, they then create an echo chamber in which they say, you see, because attacks are are attempted, they're they're attempting the attacks. This you need to doubt everything about this election. Exactly, and that becomes a social media campaign. So they hire other people to create and and to create bots, and they and you know actually it, human to to human answer, responses to accentuate that message of distrust in our election. That's what you, is that what you're saying is going on? No, it is exactly right. And that is it is exactly what was discovered in 2022. Now, um, obviously, our government, you know, takes action then to try to to, to moderate that. But it, it, these are quite sophisticated. And, uh, you know, as you described earlier, once things get on social media. So one of the things we have been doing is monitoring social media. 
And we've realized that timing is extremely important because once things start to percolate on social media, they, they gravitate to the mainstream media. And once it hits the mainstream media, where they, for example, will say, as Facebook is reporting, da 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 da, da you can't get it back in the box. It's it's out there, um, and it's it's even though the mainstream media would say, well, we're just we're just uh, reflecting what's on Facebook, and it has a lot of likes, et cetera. Um, but it's it could be totally false, and so. Then it becomes an excuse, right? Oh, it's something that we should be reporting because it's it's there, right? And that's what we that's what we heard in in this um, this litigation that Dominion brought against Fox News. Fox News says, "Well, it's there, so we should be reporting it because we're a news a news organization." And Dominion says, uh, "Well, actually, you need to you're, if you're a news organization, you need to confirm its veracity. And if you don't, if you don't, if you purposefully don't." And then they ended up with a billion dollar settlement or close to a billion dollar settlement. So that's 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 so amazing. Uh, wh- how do we deal with the fact that if we're if we're talking about government actors, the only organizations that are strong enough that have the financing and, and the personnel to deal with a government a, a sponsored attack is a government sponsored defense. Right. But let's say there's distrust in the government-sponsored defense. How do we? How, what chance do we have? Yeah, the, he, here's a couple of things. So, um, the, one of the one of the things that we have found that is beneficial is that our our legal structure is very immature in some areas, in particular with regard to mis and disinformation. But it's clearer if the origin of that is coming from foreign sources. We have laws that prevent, for example, very specifically, foreign interference in elections. So once you can can tag this to a foreign source, then it becomes a Department of Justice, FBI Department of Justice action that you can now start to go after. Now, I'm not, I think your point is a good one. It's This is quite complex, and you've watched uh, over the years that there are relatively few people who have actually been indicted on this, but there are there is some recourse. Um, I think the 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 broader issue, uh, and there are a number of people who are working on this with regard to mis and disinformation, is really an education campaign for um, you know our citizens that they need to be critical in their thinking and accepting what they're what they're uh, you know getting in the media look at multiple sources you know test whether or not this sort of makes sense etc and so there are now efforts within the school systems to start to put emphasis on critical thinking critical analysis which uh, over time will help I think sort of stem a little bit cuz you know and you probably have seen this you see some news articles, uh, something on social media, and you go, that doesn't sound right. Um, you're more sophisticated than others, um, and so you sort of discount it. And what we need to do is get more people to think that way and say, wait a minute, I'm going to check another source here, et cetera. I think that is that plus, you know, as you point out, in some cases, government action um, is, is going to be helpful. Government action against foreign adversaries. Um, over Over a period of time, we're likely to see legislation that will make it clear, but it, it, as you probably are, are aware, maybe more aware than I am, right now we're in the midst of a huge debate over the suppression of free speech, you know, and uh, and so that's going to that's gonna play out. And uh, But eventually I think it's clear that, you know, the precedent that we had, you can't go into a, a movie theater and yell fire, that we'll have some other guidelines similar to that that we can apply, but it, it's quite complex. So it seems to me that part of what is going on here, if you extend your um, your social media, right, the criminal activity, then the social media activity, but then also the discrediting. You said that that if it becomes a a government sponsored interference in something like an election, there are laws against that, and then it becomes just a department issue, and then it becomes an FBI issue where we're also seeing the discredit, discrediting of the FBI, right? We're seeing a discrediting of the Justice Department, right? So is part of the campaigns that you're seeing, is that integrated, that discrediting 
of those institutions? Is that part and parcel of these government-sponsored activities so that it weakens our defense against these activities? Well, I, I, you know, I, I would say that I don't know that I have perfect truth on this, but I would say there is likely to be some um, government-sponsored, uh, foreign government-sponsored. But I think some of this is the result of the polarization in our current society. Mm-hmm. And uh, and in fact, you know, just look at our politicians. I mean, the, the politicians, you know, for example, are looking to undermine um, the confidence in an institution like the Supreme Court, um, and uh, and and they're describing it as a political organization. Well, you know, that starts to really tug at the fundamentals of our democracy. So. I think that, that there's multiple motives at play, and I think you know uh, this is probably well beyond what what we can plan to talk to in this reform. But I think this is really a big challenge for I think leadership in both government and in the private sector to stand up and say, wait a minute, this this is eroding um, our democracy, um, and uh, we need to sort of start to to say no. We have to have confidence in our fundamental institutions. If there are problems, fine, we'll deal with them, but don't undermine the entirety of the institution. No, I really like the way the way this conversation is evolving because so often technical issues and cybercrime is a te- is as you as you pointed out at the beginning of our conversation is a technical is very often a technical issue, but it's sometimes um, segmented away from other pieces of this. And, and what where this conversation seems to be going is that we all actually need to think about civics, civil society. We all need to be thinking in much more sophisticated ways because it's not true that, you know, the FBI is has always conducted itself perfectly and always will conduct itself perfectly, right? It's, it's an organization that is a law enforcement organization. There are flaws. Right. So criticism needs to be part of that process, but undermining institutions can also be damaging. So we we have to really be actively engaged, not only on the technical side, but also in all these different other uh, matters is, you know, what do we think about our our duty as Americans if we're reporters to ver- to verify truth? I mean, that's part of it. Right. right? What do we think about our our duty as technologists? You know, should we be be coding and creating code that is attacking, capable of attack, or should we be focused on defense? Right. If if we're thinking about civil society, where do we want to earn our living? I think all these things are interconnected. So, talk a little bit about the Center for Internet Security and your role in organizing a response to these issues and in helping people like me figure out and and organizations and businesses and so on and so forth, figure out how to operate safely in this very fraught environment. So, so Mark, uh, Center for Internet Security was founded in in 2000, and it was intended to be an organization that would help define and then promulgate uh, cybersecurity best practices. And, and that is largely what we do. We do it through a collaboration methodology. We have thousands of volunteers around the world who we work with to then define what are best practices, and then we, we make them available. Um, in uh, about 2010, we got involved with an organization that then was transferred into the Center for Internet Security that was the, at the time, is still called the multi-state Information Sharing and Analysis Center. And this is focused on state and local uh, governments, tribal, territorial organizations. And the intent is to improve the security of those those organizations. And so we have this sort of dual mission um, and, uh, and what we do for state and local organizations has evolved over time. So initially it was sharing best practices, bringing people together, It has now evolved to where we also provide actually managed security services for for state and local organizations. We provide, we do vetting of products, vendor products, and we allow them to then get get selected by the state and local organizations. And so 
Um, our role in the state and local environment has uh, become, I, I would say, a sort of a trusted advisor to them. And uh, <clears throat> the role uh, in the broader you know, global society has been not only to publish best practices, but to try to influence the development of products that are more secure. Um, one, of the, one of the fundamental tenets that I should probably emphasize is um, we have <clears throat> identified that one of the, the critical needs is for organizations to prioritize to focus and prioritize. And the point there is that many of the, the guidance that's provided is so voluminous that no organization can hope to, uh, uh, to implement it fully. And so what's important is what's most important. And that's what we've been focusing on. And we have what we call the critical security controls as the name implies. These are the critical security controls. And we say, here's how you implement them. Start with here. Why? because these are the ones that are most effective against the, the key threats, et cetera. Well, that's that's interesting, because last year you gave an interview and you said there's a lot of money being invested in cybersecurity and a lot of it's being wasted. Are, is, is what you're saying that that part of the issue is that we need to take a Pareto optimal kind of a kind of a view where we we invest prioritization will help us to invest wisely. If we take, you know, the 20 percent of the things that are that cause the most attacks and we invest there is that is that part of what you're saying exactly that's exactly it's it's such a simple concept right but it it uh, is one that is not well appreciated um and so there is uh, in fact one of our uh, our uh, individuals we call him our chief evangelist he he's coined a term he calls it the fog of more that more tools, more guidance, et cetera. Right. And it just creates this um, illusion that you've actually improved security. And in many cases you haven't because they the 20%, as you say, is the foundation pieces. And if you don't have those, you can spend a lot of money on sophisticated things. But if you haven't done the foundation, and I used the term hygiene before, if you don't have the fundamental hygiene, the, the spending money on sophisticated tools is a waste of money. But many, many security people, they want to do the cool stuff. And the cool stuff is with all the fancy tools, et cetera. And they skip the foundation. So that's it's that simple. Well, I, you know, I can endorse that. I, I'll tell you a story, which you'll really appreciate. We so we recruit nonprofit leaders and then we draw attention to their work. So this is the latter part of that mission. But we are sometimes invited to do a search, because there are very few search firms that can actually do this kind of stuff, for CIOs yeah. on the heels of an attack. And in, in particular cases, we've actually seen organizations have been almost shut down by ransomware criminals. Um, and I mean, these are nonprofits that are providing essential services to people who are disabled, people with health conditions. You know, they're very sensitive government uh, agencies and so on and so forth. And it's always the simple stuff. It's always the simple stuff. It's never the, the you know, the complicated, you know, you know, space engineering things. It's it's simple blocking and tackling. And, you know, in, in retrospect, people can say, oh, well, if we had just backed up things, if we had created some safeguards, if we had, if we had decided to um, create an architecture that was more resilient, very, very simple things. And of course, afterwards they do that, right? Through uh, often through the people that we that we recruit. But uh, if I if you were to tell me, Mark, here are the top three things you need to think about as you go back to your organization. What are those top three things? What are the what are the top priorities that that I should equip myself with, either as a person or as a leader of an organization, to keep things safe? Yeah, I, th I think I would say it's probably not just three, or if the if I gave you three, they'd be very general. Right. But it is things like um, understand what's on your network, hardware and software. Now, this is simple uh, configuration management. That's when we talk about hygiene. Um, many organizations don't know what's on their network. So when there's something that comes up on the network that is something that is a foreign entity, it's not in the they don't know it. So it's that simple. 
um, keep keep up to date on configurations. Um, you know, uh, in the technical world, the products that are released often are then subsequently found to need improvements, sometimes security. Well, you, you have to continue to update the software. If you don't, then especially once these are publicized, then, then it becomes a race and to, the attackers are looking to exploit yeah. their so, access, right? Yeah. Access, who has access? So yeah, so, yeah. Who who has you know? So it's those types of things that when we look at the prioritization, we say there's a set of those things, and we have uh, you know we have very specific um, identification of these are the exact uh, steps. This is how you verify that in fact you have done it, and that's that's what sort of distinguishes I think Center for Internet Security from many other efforts which are much higher granularity. We actually provide very specific, very, you know, step prioritized, do these things, here's how you would test it, and then you can move on. And in fact, what we find is many people who are um, asked to use, for, exist, for example, the NIST cybersecurity framework, or uh, IEEE or ISO or payment card industry standard, they then come to the CIS, our critical security controls, because we have the actual specifics of what, what does it mean to actually do those things. And so it's not that we're in competition, we just provide a bit more granularity, but the, the most important thing back to the earlier point is prioritization, do these first. And then on a, on a personal basis, right, we should always try to verify, you know, on the social media stuff, on the disinformation stuff, we should always be skeptical about whatever we're being told and, and just do the normal information hygiene stuff of skeptical information consumers, right? I, exactly. I mean, it's it, again, some of this is so seems so simple, but uh, it, it uh, is difficult. And I would add one final point, Mark, and that is I think um, we're in a phase where we it's a really a leadership challenge and we need our politicians, our, our corporate leaders to really stand up for th these fundamental principles of our democracy and not to, I mean, what I see often is the politicians are taking advantage of the fragmentation to their personal benefit. And that's, and that's we need to, uh, to recognize that. And maybe that's not the type of person we want in the, in the office. Uh, so. The, the same thing for businesses, right? I mean, we we create the company, we create the country that we buy through our consumer behavior, right? We through our votes. So I think we all need to think about this: what to create a a good world that we want to live in that protects our rights, that respects di different viewpoints. How do we behave? What do we buy? Who do we do business with? Exactly. John Gilligan, thank you so much for explaining the work of the Center for Internet Security, and thank you for sharing your perspectives. I mean, this is really a rare kind of an opportunity for us to talk so expansively about, about a technical issue that affects us all. We so appreciate your, your help in this. All right, Mark, I enjoyed it. Thank you very much.